Good morning, I'm Julio Sainz along with Marisa Riveras. Today we'll meet Libradora Paz and learn how she's worked with both migrant workers and now owns her own business. We hope you will be inspired. Celebrating leaders in Rochester's unique and vibrant business community, we'll meet entrepreneurs whose passion and perseverance have helped push through life's challenges. Join us as we share their stories and journeys to success. It's time to be inspired. Thank you very much for being in Be Inspired today, a show that we have developed to interview people like you, who are people who really ex inspire us, people who have overcome a lot of challenges, and your life is really an expression of that. Let's start with a basic question. Who is Librada Paz? Uh, yes. Um... Librada Paz came in from Oaxaca, Mexico, which is uh, southern Mexico, and it's a region of um, a lot of poor, uh, or there's a lot of poverty, and then a lot of indigenous uh, groups uh, around. So basically, I grew up there uh, into uh, pretty much uh, being a teenager, and then I decided to migrate to the United States. But um, I grew up speaking Mixteco, which is called Mixte in English and Mixteco in Espanol. <laughs> and so I actually learned Spanish, um, I think maybe um, at the age of 10 or so, I started to learn Spanish. And then when I came to the United States, I actually didn't even know, uh, I guess, um, well enough Spanish. I mean, I just knew basic Spanish, but I didn't know like a proficient Spanish or something like that. So I came here and then learned Spanish at the same time with English. So it, it was a challenge, but that's, that's just who I am. And I am here. <laughs> So Librada, you arrived to the United States, speak, trying to understand Spanish, and of course, then you jump to English. Yes. And in that process, it was very hard for you. Uh, you. Then I understood that you went to the university, you went to RIT and studied mechanical engineer, I think. So tell us a little bit that story and what happened there. Uh, you know what? Um, God, I think it was such a challenge. Challenge, it was because, uh, First, because of the language. The language, like I said, I did not know uh, well enough Spanish when I got into high school here. And then uh, also I struggled. I think I struggled because I was so shy. I was timid. And because I was so timid, I had to, uh, you know, uh, to have a hard time to learn English uh, because I didn't want to um, socialize with the people or with my classmates. I didn't really want to speak to them. I didn't really want to talk to them because uh, I was afraid. I was so embarrassed that they're going to laugh at me. So I think that's that's such a bad thing when you don't understand that socialize is the best thing to do. But uh, that's, that's what it uh, took me such a, a long time to get better in Spanish, I mean, in English and Spanish. So uh, when I went uh, uh, to college, uh, go to C, I'm on Joy Community College, and then transfer to RIT. Um, I struggled a lot to understand the classes because I did not know the terminology. I mean, imagine uh, no background, so engineer in high school or even in Mexico, and then come here and then jump into uh, taking classes of engineering. I had to really face the challenge because I didn't have any of those uh, terms in, in high school, so I had to learn uh what do they mean and so it took me very very hard uh hard time in order for me to really understand uh, the classes i like it though i, I really like the classes but the problem was that um i i couldn't understand the language itself once i understood the language itself they explained it to me well enough i really like it and i really uh wanted to go through that way so so um it was a challenge but you know you had to do what you do you had to to, you wanted to do in order for you to get what you want because that's that's what I desirely want belly so so I had to go for it nice. facing a lot of obstacles though sure, sure. <laughs> so, and, um, did you uh did you stay in the engineering field or did you uh get inspired to uh work in uh, uh, some other fields uh you know what I really uh like math but i think my major thing was that i really like engineering i really like the design machine the robots thing that's what i really wanted and i i found out that that's what it calls mechanical engineer and, and that's how i end up uh, going to rit because um you know it was um 
I think it was the closest uh, place that I could uh, go and then afford it because I didn't have any support either. I mean, even though I had a, I had my partner at the time, but um, he um, he was not too in favor of my education. So it, it was such a challenge for me to also, uh, you know, um, be able to uh, do well actually. Right, and Librada, in that stage of your life, now you went to the university, you really overcome the challenge to learn a different language and really get in a high level education like RIT in a, in a very you know, different environment for you. And then you receive this call to go and work with the migrant workers and start working with the farming community and help the farmers and help most importantly, the people who come and work out in the field. So tell us a little bit what happened in that moment in your life. What inspired you to go and help the migrant community and specifically the farmers? So when I came to the United States, they just did not know anything. And then besides, because I did not know anything, I didn't have a status here. You know, I, I'm sure that a lot of people understand what status means. So I'm not going to go and explain that. But so when you come here, you, you have no other option than just end up to where other um you know, people from your town go through, so they end up working on the farm, and that's how I end up working on the farm. And um, I think that that's the hardest thing that I faced because I came to the United States, go straight to work on the farm, and I did not like uh, the way that farm workers were living. I did not like the way that I was uh, experiencing uh, through the fields, uh, living crowdly, and, and then also the working condition, and the sexual harassment and the sexual abuse that I faced, you know, and it just, it, it really impacted me in a very bad way. And, you know, through the months, um, a year and a half after, I really decided that I wanted to go back to school because I didn't want that life. And that's what I did, you know. I say, I came in for the better life, expecting that it's going to be better. So I just can't keep on on the farm and can't I, I want to be somebody and that was the reason that it, I decided to come and, and just hopefully it will be better for me than just be in Mexico and just be nobody you know so when I came here I had that opportunity to go back to school and which was not easy because I did not know the language but I had to struggle uh, but you know the desire of being somebody uh, I think it's it's really uh, it's really what it hold me to to push me through um, the tacos and say, you know what, I can do it. I'm going to do it. This is what I want because I don't want that life. I, I just simply didn't like the life that I was living. And I wanted to be somebody, you know. So uh, I kept on going. I know that it wasn't easy because by the time that I was going to graduate high school, I, I was actually pregnant of my older uh, son. And so... Uh, having a family and go to college, it was not easy at all. And, and so when I graduated, I had a lot of experience with a migrant worker as um, being a migrant of myself or being a farm worker myself, and they had an experience. So um, I had to go back and help, you know, uh, and then that's how actually they, uh, the organization started to hire me, you know, uh, a local clinic. And they hire me because I had the languages, and then that's how I ended up working with uh, an organization that's called Rural Migrant Ministry, a nonprofit organization that actually was lobbying for the workers. And when I joined them, I realized that uh, I had a lot to share because I, as a former farm worker, and then also um, had a lot of background with uh, the farm workers themselves because I already went back and do a lot of uh, outreach and all those things. Can you tell us some of the crops in the area that are that we can thank migrant workers for? What, what are the, some of the crops that they, they harvest? Yeah, in, in New York State, I mean, it's a huge agriculture. A lot of people don't know that it's a state of a lot of agriculture. They harvest um, uh, potato, onion, cabbage, and a lot of other vegetables, for example, cucumber, uh, zucchini, butternut squash, and a lot of cherries. And then besides cherries, they have grapes, and then also, of course, apples uh, and dairy farms. So, so those are the big, big things that they harvest around, you know? And so- Just to ask um, you, we know so much about the wine industry in the area. Do the migrant workers pick the, the grapes for the wine industry in the area? Uh, they do have a lot of winery, and they do pick them for, um, uh, for the wines, 
actually they're not for the market but most of them are for the wine or for the winery so um yes they do of course i mean in buffalo area if you go all the way to buffalo area and uh, going through um erie uh there's a lot of uh wine and also in long island they have a lot of grapes too so yeah we have a huge agricultural uh, wines also in, in the finger lakes we also have a huge crops there so yes it's huge so uh, I think uh, also I wanted to add yeah, because a lot of people don't. I think um, when I actually joined Rural Germany, a lot of people did not know that it, the agriculture in New York State is huge. So when we start speaking out, we did a lot of rallies, we did a lot of uh, marches, we did a lot of um, education through different events, educating uh, students, uh, the high school students, college students, and you know people to pay. And that's what it brought uh, awareness to the people in order for them to support our uh, farm workers. And it took us quite a long time in order for us to get a lot of support for people to support the uh, farm workers issue uh, because they actually had um, the basic right included, which means that they did not have a day off, they did not have overtime. And a lot of people work uh, tons of tons of hours. And would, some of them will work 70 hours or 80 hours per week and uh, not over time. And then I think the, the biggest thing is that um, people, I mean, do people do want to work? But the problem is that in the long term, it actually affects your health because you're working on, uh, you focus on working and working and there's no time for you to really focus on your health. So a lot of people get sick in that way. Well, thank you so much, Libra. We'll be back with more after these messages. Right, Librada, it's very interesting your story because I love you. You came as an, uh, a, a migrant and not even speaking Spanish, <laughs> only speaking your native language, learn Spanish, then learn English, then go to uh, MCC, then go to RIT, then start working with the migrant community, you know, working in the farming. Uh, you have been fundamental in terms, of course, of the Worker rights and the, you know, the farmers, specifically the, the workers' uh, rights. And one thing that I think is fundamental is what has been the approach to balance, because we believe in the rights of the workers, but also we want to make sure that entrepreneurs and business go, because if there's no business, there's no opportunity for workers. So you have been part of fundamental changes in the legislation. I know that you, you were part of one of the most important changes in the uh, labor law for migrants, in the migrant workers. And my question to you is how you balance the economic development aspect, because we need farms, we need production, but also we want workers who are you know, fairly Definitely. compensated. So how are you able to balance that? You were in the middle of that. You know what? I think the problem is that um, farmers actually had a lot of hard time to focus on or how to actually um, have a little bit of respect and dignity to the workers that they actually also need a day of rest. Uh, I think that's the, uh, the, um, a lot of lack of knowledge, or I don't know if I should say lack of knowledge. The problem is that, you know, when there's no right, you say, ah, well, there's no right, so why should I respect uh, a right that it doesn't exist? So I think that was the, the, the challenge we had to educate people to, to think different because they are so used to uh, of this law that it has been uh, for over 80 years that they had the slavery thing, you know, a long time ago they had a slavery and the law never changed into, into the agriculture. So if the law never changes to the agriculture, so uh, people are so used to, to do it that way, like you say, you know, so used to not follow any rule or any law because there wasn't any. So when we would try to educate people, we want the basic right for the workers. It's not that we wanted to kick you off the business or it's not that we don't want you to be an entrepreneur, like what you say. The problem is that we want to respect those dignity of the workers. We want them to have a good life. We want them to have a little bit of respect because they're working so hard and a lot of people don't even have a break. A lot of people don't, oh, ding, I'm sorry. And a lot of people didn't um, have a day of rest, like what we said. And for example, right now, there's a lot of um, workers that like to go out and then explore one day uh, during the week, uh, some activities, social activities or something like that. Of course, we can't right now so much for the COVID, but that's what a lot 
I don't do it sometimes at least once a day per week. But when you're working uh, the whole seven days a week, there's no time for you to socialize. And, and when you don't socialize, there is no life for the workers. You know, uh, people have to also have life. I think that's what a lot of people, a lot of the farmers didn't realize that workers do need those life. I mean, you you need to, you know, for example, um, get out early, at least learn some English, do something else that you, you always wanted to do. But workers did not have those chance because they work I am all the way sometimes to 7, 9 p.m. Or if they planting outside summertime, they will get out into 9, 10 p.m. So do people have time to really focus on their family, to really focus on their life, to really focus on who they are as a family? They don't have that. I think that's the problem that a lot of the farmers didn't really realize that they are also human beings, not just a tool that you just, you know, use them and then no time, no overtime, no break, no nothing. It's just a lot of fun. Farmers actually were taking advantage of them that way. Not all of the farmers, so just to ensure that not all of the farmers, but uh, all of the farmers that didn't really care so much about the workers. So, so that's the education that we were trying to educate everybody in, in both sides, like what you said, balancing. So, so Lira, just so people are clear, I mean, these folks aren't getting paid by the hour, they're getting paid by the bucket or by the, the, the amount of fruit or vegetable that they, they pick. Um, and what What's the day? Like, how early do they start and how late do they finish? Like, well, walk us through what a typical day is like. Uh, well, it changed because it depends on the season. For example, in New York, you know, we have a lot of uh, different seasons. So so it changed. For example, in New York, in wintertime, I mean, uh, workers had to go and trim trees outside. Uh, can you imagine when it's uh, zero degree and if workers don't go to work, they're just simply not going to get paid. And it doesn't matter whether they pay by pieces or by hours. Workers don't have those day offs uh, if they don't work. So they have to go to work in order for them to get paid. So that's for outside. Uh, winter, actually, it's just trimming tree. That's what mostly the workers have, um, unless that they're working on a dairy farm or in the packaging. So uh, in spring, when they start planting, uh, you know, they had to plant onion, they had to plant cabbages and other vegetables. So uh, they actually start early. For example, when they plant cabbage, a lot of people right now, they're still planting cabbages. So they had to start early in the morning and depends how how much to uh, plant. So some people might have to work kind of late. Uh, I know that a while ago, they used to work so, so late before the law changed, you know, because now that they had to pay people um, over time after 60 hours. So before that, they had to work into very late now. Now the farmers actually don't want to pay over time. So they try to stop then not to go so much beyond 60 hours. So, yeah, it has changed actually a lot now. Well, Librada you know, has been interesting to see the evolution of, I think, a, a, a more fair environment. We still have gaps in the farming industry. Uh, but now I go to Librada Pass again back, and, and, and you are a business entrepreneur too. So you now are running a, a small business, helping with taxes. So let's talk about this last chapter of your life because I love to see you know your evolution on different things helping the migrant workers involved with this uh they're part of the legislation and now also running your own business as a small business entrepreneur with the taxes helping the taxes so how is running your business uh do you know what I I think <laughs> uh besides being so shy I always like to learn things I always like to learn things. I always like to, you know, explore different things and things like that. And also, if I say, if I learn, I don't have to go and, and you know, pay somebody when I can do it myself. So I actually uh, learned a long time ago to do my own tax. And that's how I started because I really wanted to learn to do my own tax. And so I, I started it. And, you know, step by step, I'm learning. And then I did it once. I'm like, okay, I can do it. And now I'm going to do my brother's taxes, uh, my friend's taxes. And, and you know, uh, without realizing, a lot of people start asking because, of course, I mean, my closest friend, uh, you know, sometimes they say, why don't you do mine? Why don't you do mine? I was like, okay, sure, why not? I can try, you know. And then by the end, uh, by the time, a lot of workers actually, um, 
as you know, a lot of workers don't have social security numbers, so they had to apply for IT. And so a lot of workers actually asked me, why don't you try to get me an IT number? And so I started to really help. It was more like a helping the workers, not really do it as a business, you know, just helping them out. What a story. You know, Librada, uh, we can probably have a next chapter of this show, but you have really inspired us because seeing you, where you come from, and be able to navigate through different areas in your life and be now a business owner yourself, it's exciting. And for me, this is United States. This is the United States that we love, that brings the opportunity for people, that brings the options, and you have basically worked through all those. You have been educated, and you have been able to fight and fight for the rights of the workers, but also develop your own business. So Librada, thank you for time. It was really an honor to have, have you today in our program, and I am sure in the future we will have you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Coming up next week, we'll meet Matt and Shannon Jones, the owners of Poop Strength, a fast-growing sports training business with a brand new facility in Henrietta. To watch today's episode and the complete interviews of our guests, go to rochesterfirst.com slash be inspired. For more great talk with Rochester's entrepreneurs, listen to Bullet 97.1, Saturdays at 9 a.m. For Mauricio Riveros, I'm Julio Sainz. We'll see you next week on Be Inspired. <laughs>